we want to pick up where we left off and talk about the composition of boards and things like that. Yeah. Here's how I feel about board size. If you think that the board is the most important factor in a successful organization, I like to have a large board. It's just the way I like to operate. Now, everyone will want to operate perhaps a little differently, but I say the most important function of a board is to hire and evaluate the CEO. The second most important function is to not allow a deficit. Now, I don't mean a financial deficit. I mean a mission deficit, because it's really easy to balance the budget. You say, well, we'll have fewer programs. We won't be open as often as we have in the past. We'll defer our maintenance. Our staff won't get salaries. And so we'll cut our expenses to meet our income. Mm. But that's not the way to have a vital organization. You want to have enough money to meet your mission. And if a board is not meeting its mission, it has a mission deficit, and it needs to be concerned about that. So I like having a large board. Somebody says, well, you only need a few people to make major decisions. My response to that is, well, how many major decisions? do you really make mm -hmm. that you can do with a few people? But I want a board where I can raise funds. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, an important role for the board. I agree completely, and more important today than ever, that the board raise funds. And so I agree with you that the board should be large. I say to people, when I come across a board of 20 or 25 and they're not fundraising, I say, well, why do you have all these people? Because I don't think it takes 20 or 25 people to make most of the decisions of the you're, organization. You're right. So if you're going to have that board, they should be fundraising. I mean, once Absolutely. you've got a CEO, which, as you say, is the number one thing, hire and evaluate yeah. the CEO, the next thing is not allowing a deficit. And part of that is by finding the resources to run the organization exactly. well. We had an interesting thing happen at a hospital in Providence, Rhode Island. My first board meeting there, and the room was set up for about 80 people. And I said, let's get rid of some of the chairs, because you don't want empty chairs. Right. They said, oh, we'll fill them. Well, I said, how many board members do we have? And he said, we have 90. <laughs> 90 board members. But every one of them understood what their role was, and that was raising money and giving, mm -hmm. giving. And part of being on the board was the gifts that they had to make. And when we had a campaign, those 90 board members gave over 90% of what was given. Aha! Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. I think we're on to something here. And that answers in part, I think, the question about diversity. Yes, I think a board needs to be diverse. Yes, I feel diversity is important. But if you believe that the role of the board is not to allow a mission deficit, then you better have diverse people on your board who can make sure that's not happening. And that would be the difference about having diversity on the board. This issue of diversity on the board is so significant, and I struggle with it myself because I'm a big believer in diversity in all ways, yet I also understand the pressure everyone's under, and the pressure staff are under, and trying to accomplish all of this is almost impossible to raise all the funds and have the diversity and all the different voices. And and so I, I worry about that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because it just does seem challenging. And related to this, we have board members who sit on multiple boards. Yeah. 
Uh, what's your take on that as we're looking for board members who are available and I hate, who are I, committed? I hate the term sitting on a board. <laughs> Serving on a board yes. ought to be more like it. And I say you cannot serve on more than two boards because if you really are serious about a board member helping with the mission deficit, they can't be giving to a lot of other. So when we do our recruiting and I come to you and we go through it and I say, Brian, I'd love to have you serve on our board. And you say, well, I really believe you're doing important things, but I can't give because I have a couple other boards that I give to. The answer ought to be, oh, well, thanks for letting us know. I don't think you would be happy with us because all board members give $10,000 or whatever it is. I think that becomes important. By the way, if you're recruiting and you have someone who says, yes, you can use my name, mm. but I won't be able to attend meetings, what do you say, Brian? Oh, I say no. This is a challenge. People look at these wonderful potential board members and they think we must have them. And I think you dilute your board. Absolutely. You, you really break up that, that esprit de corps that you're looking for where everyone's sure. in it together. It's discouraging. Absolutely. To have a board where four or five key people don't attend. It's interesting that you just said two is your limit. My fantasy is one, that everyone yes. picks one organization. <laughs> I thought you were going to say three, at least, maybe three. Two is, uh, I can live with two. <laughs> <laughs> sure. That would be excellent. You know, sometimes when we're talking about board members and their giving, and we all talk about personally significant gifts and what that means, one of the definitions is it should be one of the top gifts you give anywhere. Right? Exactly. And that alone is a problem when someone's sitting on a number of boards, yeah. their gift to you isn't going to be one of their top gifts. Brian, I have a, um, a letter of understanding that we ask board members to sign every year. And one of the things that they sign to is that they will attend meetings, that they will be roaring advocates, not just advocates, roaring advocates, and that they will make this their first philanthropic priority, and if not the first, perhaps the second. But you want them to continue giving to their church also. Right. So we try to make that clear, and that's part of the understanding. And here again, if your listeners would like copies of that, I'd be glad to make it available. Wonderful. We'll give them that information Good. in the closer. So talking about personally significant gifts, this is one of my hot button topics, this idea of minimum gifts. I have a whole philosophy myself on minimums, uh, but I'm wondering what you're doing these days with boards, what you're advising them to. Oh, okay. I'll share mine. <laughs> yeah, you go ahead. Uh, I don't like board minimums because... I think that most people then feel everyone else is giving at the minimum, and if they give that gift that they're doing their board duty, I think that the minimum ends up getting set artificially low so that most people can meet it. And if you're not going to talk to them individually about their giving like you would with any other donor, you can't maximize their giving in that the minimum is, in my mind, often a substitute for doing the hard work of sitting down and maximizing their gifts. What do you think of that? <laughs> like everything, there are two schools of thought. <laughs> there are. Tell me yours. Yeah. I like board members to know what we expect. Mm -hmm. And um, we had an interesting thing happen in American Diabetes. We were talking about going from... $5,000 a year to $10,000 a year. And um, most of my clients now are at, first of all, they went from 1000 to 5000 mm -hmm. and some now have gone to 10000 At Orange County Center for the Performing Arts, the board members are at $100,000 a year. I said, 
Do you have trouble recruiting board members? He said, no, we have a waiting list. So if you're that kind of an organization, mm-hmm. you can do it. Right, and there is something with organizations that have a very high profile and the largest sure. organizations that sometimes have an easier job with these sure. high thresholds yeah. because those expectations are known and, as you say, they're, they're, people sometimes are clamoring to get yeah. on those boards. So American Diabetes, we were split about going from 5,000 to 10,000. And some on the board said, we really need to stick with 5,000. And some said, you know, we were brought on to do other things. And that's all understandable. Mm -hmm. But the discussion went on and on. And um, finally, Margaret got up. And she said, you know, I find it very upsetting that we're spending all of this time about increasing our board giving $5,000. She said... Look at this board. She said, we're on this board for three years. Some of us are renewed and on for another three years, but that's it. And she said, in six years, we ought to give cumulative giving of a quarter of a million dollars. And I thought, I'm going to lose this board. They'll be very upset. But they voted to do that. Mm. And then I'm thinking, nobody asked before that they reach that high. And so I think it will depend on every organization. Mm -hmm. There are some communities, some organizations, where $100 might be a stretch. Absolutely. So there's no specific answer, but we have to let people know if the board doesn't care, why should anybody else? Right. I like to, as I'm meeting with potential candidates, explain that there is a range of giving, that everyone is giving something personally significant mm-hmm. to him or herself, and that that might range from $1,000 for someone of more modest means to twenty five or $50,000 for good, those good, good. who are at the top, so that people understand that whole spectrum of right. giving without giving them an exact number which might make it harder for me to get towards the top of their giving sure. when I sit down with them. Yeah. But it means sitting down they, with each yeah, person sure. individually, which I sure. think actually should be a requirement. What I don't like is to say board members give or get mm. X number of dollars because experience shows they never get. <laughs> and so they don't give, they don't get. Or... Some of them give because it's easy to give and don't help with the getting, which can be very <laughs> difficult. So that's also a problem. I'm totally with you. I'm not a give or get person. I think yeah. everyone should be giving and getting to the best of their absolutely, ability. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Right. So, Jerry, in one of our sessions, you started to talk about the Ten Commandments of Meetings that you had developed, and you gave us the preamble and talked briefly about one topic of making sure meetings are meaningful. But what are what are all the commandments? Well, the old chief began hearing of all the complaints. And being old and wise, hearing of those things decreed that something must be done, there was prepared a tablet which contained ten great wisdoms. Thou shalt not meet if the matter can be resolved by other means. Thou shalt make the purpose of each meeting known to those that are summoned. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt bring together only those whose presence is needed. Thou shalt start on time and stop when it is right so to do. Thou shalt not run beyond. Thou shouldest combine into one meeting those items which need not be separated. You should prepare thy thoughts before speaking. Thou shalt not schedule a meeting in haste, for the day is short in which to do all that we must have done. We shall prepare to cancel or not to meet if there be no need. 
And in time the people learned and obeyed these writings. As they forsook their old ways, new hours untold were given unto them. They were free to do great and important things. They saw that it was good. And you ask about the Tenth Commandment. One who was very wise in years and knowledge proclaimed to all, cancel the meeting and save the donuts. <laughs> Let's say we know board members have a limited amount of time. And I see them spending a lot of that time in board meetings and committee meetings, which are important. But I always think of how we might reapportion that time. Yeah. How would you, let's say a board member has 50 hours a year to give to an organization, an average of an hour a week. How would you spend those 50 hours? Mm, interesting. Well, you're really torn. Of course. You know that serving on a board is one of the major factors in having a trustee give you his time and his money. You know that that's a major factor. And by the way, that's an interesting question. Do you try to get somebody on the board who you feel in time will be a good board member, but right now is not related in any way to the board? But you know, if they get involved, they will do great things for you. It's an interesting question. Yeah, you have to be pretty sure because I think there are many cases where we do something on a hope and a prayer and it doesn't go our way because we haven't done our due diligence and there isn't a mutual understanding. But you put your finger on it, due diligence. Yes. I'm a great believer also in giving out report cards so that at the end of the fiscal year, usually, um, we give every board member a grade on, I think it's nine or ten different items. And I'd be glad to share that with you. What do you do about board members that aren't performing? I think at the end of the year, when you give them the report card, Brian, I know you love us, and we love you too, but you know, during the year, we only had four board meetings, and you only came to one. Maybe this isn't a good time for you to serve on our board. You know, we can come back and ask you to serve again at another time. By the way, we'll never do that. <laughs> but... um and the board member then can say, because they know that you're finding they're not returning their phone calls, they're avoiding you, they're embarrassed. Let them go their own way and save them, because otherwise you'll lose them forever. So I would say to you, perhaps not, not as good a time for you to serve on our board. Mm -hmm. And then you would have the option of saying, no, 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 you know I want to serve. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I took this on too quickly. I should have thought it through. Mm -hmm. So they make the decision. So back to the 50 hours. <laughs> oh, yeah. I haven't forgotten that. I'm. It's a tough one, but... How would you apportion the 50 hours a board member might have to devote to your organization? Oh, when, you, when you're doing the recruiting? Or just in general, in, in your mind, right? Let's say you're a CEO or you're a board chair and you want to get the most out of the board member who's sitting there. And the board member says, I have 50 hours to give you this year. You decide how you want to use them. How do you want to use my time? Ah. How would you do that? We've got board meetings, committee meetings. We have coming to programs, and we have time to cultivate It's interesting. I, and such. I haven't had in all my time that comment or question. Excellent. It's, it's a great question. And I would probably say, Brian, that's a great question. <laughs> <Let's>, <laughs> <You're hatching. laughs> 
<laughs> let's, yes. let's get together another time Excellent. Okay. and work it out. Very good. good. Yeah. And I have to say, as we close this session, I am very proud of myself for coming up with a question that Jerry Pattis <laughs> hasn't heard before. I would have thought there wasn't a single oh. one, given your history. So I'm going to take that as, I can't say a win, but I'm proud of that, and we're going to talk about that next. 